Good afternoon. This is Tim Selden. I'm president of the Monastery Foundation, and with me is my colleague, Dr. Michael Doerr. Michael Doerr is a past president of the American Monastery Society. He's a very highly experienced Montessori elementary guide, uh, early childhood as well, uh, elementary as a teacher educator, and the director of a couple of excellent Montessori teacher education programs, once at St. Catharines for a number of years, and then later at Westminster College in Salt Lake City. Uh, Utah, where he also helped develop that program and ran it for a number of years. Michael, welcome back as always. Thank you, Tim. It's really it's a pleasure to be here to see you and hello to everybody that's out there. Should we start off, Tim? Our, so this is part two of the series. Mm -hmm. I wondered if there were questions still out there from last time, if there are any. Well, I'm sure there are, Michael. I see one here. <clears throat> importance of short and concise lessons. But many of the lessons in science and geography and history are long and multi-step and they're very complex. How do you make those short and brief? You know, that's really a good question. And I'm going to suggest a few ways that you can try to do something with those. The first thing uh, is to realize not all lessons are created equal. Some are short just by their very nature, and they may be even just a handful of minutes, just very, very short. And some, by their nature, will be longer. It's just one of those things. So yes, when I say to make them concise, brief, crisp, I use words like that, it doesn't mean that all lessons will be the same length. That's impossible. But it does mean to trim the fat. So it's really easy to get led off into other territory while we're giving a lesson. For example, if we want to give a science lesson to lower elementary or children's house children about the parts of the fish, we might end up saying, today we're going to talk about fish. Now fish are really important. Yes, Tim, were you about to say something? And Tim says, yeah, my dad likes to fish. Now, what am I going to do with that comment? If I take that comment and say, oh, he does. What kind of fish does he like? Where do you go fishing? Do you like to eat fish? What kind? And on and on. We've lost track of the direct aim. And when you lose track of the direct aim, your lesson by definition has become aimless. That is one of the things we don't want to let happen. We need to say something like, Wow, Tim, that's an interesting comment. Let's go back to the parts of the fish again so that you redirect back to where you are. So those longer, more complex lessons require discipline on our part. Now, a second thing is if we have multiple direct aims, that this is so complicated that there is aim number one, aim number two, aim number three, Maybe that lesson should not be one mega lesson, but maybe we should divide it up into two parts. Not everything can be done that way, but some things can be. And that allows children to learn, understand, and comprehend something before we go on to the rest. So it's not all piled on in, in one great big heap. But remember, no matter how you do it, it's really important to stay on task, to always let the aim, particularly the direct aim, be in the forefront of what it is we're trying to do. Or you know, the lesson just starts to drift. And if children begin to understand that you are easily let off track, then that's going to happen more and more. So that's what I can suggest to you at this time. That's great. Well, Bonnie asked this question, Michael. When you're moving forward in math, if a student doesn't complete the follow-up work, how do you move forward and be sure the child understands the material? Wow, what a great question. You know, there. let me look at two big reasons of why follow-up work is not completed. Number one is it's our problem, the teacher's problem. 
Yes. And here's how you figure it out. You need to observe. And observing is one of the most important jobs of the Montessori teacher. So take the time to observe the children during the period of time that they're doing follow-up work. And I want you to know, is that child or those children, are they actually working on the follow-up work, but not able to complete it? If that's the case, that they are working away at it, but they don't get it done, then the follow-up work is poorly designed. We need to design work that can actually be completed in the time that's allotted for its completion. Otherwise, it's my problem as teacher. I've done a disservice to the children by asking them to do work that they can't get done. But there's a second possibility, and that is that the children are not actually working on it, yet they don't, and then they don't get it done because they're not focused on the work. And in that case, Again, even though it's the child, I'd say it's our problem to do something that develops motivation, interest, and focus so that you get that on-task behavior that the children are actually doing the work. Now, it's thirdly, it's possible that a child simply isn't capable of accomplishing this particular task that you've asked for. In which case, you need to do differentiated follow-up work. Differentiated follow-up work means that I'm going to give one child a slightly different follow-up work than the next child. And the reason for that is, the reason for differentiation across the board is always to personalize the work and to make it speak to the child's abilities in particular. So I don't think the lesson should be changed according to children's abilities. Everybody has a right to the same information, but the follow-up work will need to be differentiated in many cases. So look at those three things. Number one, remember, did you give too much work to be able to be done in that time? Number two, are they actually at work? And both of those need to be addressed by your observation. And number three, can you differentiate the work so that it's more appropriate to each individual in the group. Beautiful, Michael. Um, <clears throat> Irene asks, do you do every great lesson every single year? And if so, how do you ever carve out enough time to do that? <laughs> I'm a great lesson fanatic. I believe in the great lessons. Um, I'm old enough to remember a musical group called the Monkees. Maybe you remember them, Tim. Oh, yeah. And, uh, they sang a song called I'm a Believer, and I'm a Believer in the Great Lessons. That wasn't what they were singing about, but it's what I'm singing about. I believe that we should, yes, we should give the Great Lessons as a collective, which is a Montessori term that means the whole group. We should give that as a collective annually, all five of them, in order, starting with the first Great Lesson, followed by the second, third, fourth, and so on, that we're fought then, and that we should have those five great lessons completed, if at all possible, by the end of October. Now that means that we have to do a couple of things. One, we've, and, and you're aware of this, we've got to budget our time. You've got to budget your time for those things. You can't let them run away, just what I was talking about before. Number two, for the first great lesson, that is a real bear, isn't it? That often is the stopper for people. They, they can't do the first great lesson, that's the story of the universe, because of all the experiments. And therefore, they don't ever get to the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth because they're still way back stuck on that first one. Here's the solution. And this was the traditional solution brought forth by Mario Montessori, and that is first, first, do the experiments of which there are about, depending on where you took training, anywhere from 18 to 25 experiments. Do those first. You can do about two of those or maybe three a day. So it'll take you about a week or two, maybe 10 days, maybe even three weeks 
to present all those experiments. Now give that first grade lesson free of the experiments. If you separate those things, which Montessori calls isolating the difficulty, if you separate those two things, when you give the first grade lesson, you can refer back, and you should refer back to the experiments. So maybe you remember there's an experiment that you heat up a cast iron pan until it's hot, hot, hot on a, on a um, hot plate. And then you take just a single drop of water and you drop that drop of water and it goes sizzle like that. The name of that experiment is called instant evaporation. Well, when I'm talking about the first great lesson I can talk about, there came a time when rain finally began to fall. Can you imagine that first raindrop that ever managed to hit the surface of the earth? It went and instantly evaporated, just like what we did. Remember when we did that experiment? So in that way, you're referring back to it, but you're not performing the experiment, which means you're not interrupting the work, and you're not trying to set up that first grade lesson with a plethora of science equipment that just is a killer for a lot of people. I don't think you're going to have problems with the other four lessons. I don't think so. I think the problem is getting through that first one. And yes, I do it every year. Uh, Hilary DaCosta asks this question. How do you respond to students who were invited to simply observe a lesson, but they weren't invited to the lesson, but they want to do the follow-up work? Oh, I love it. <laughs> you know, isn't that wonderful that they want to do the follow-up work? But here's the catch. Are they doing the follow-up work from their own lesson that was actually their own lesson? So that's what I say. How are you doing on your own lesson, Maria? Let's take a look at, I know that at your math lesson was such and such. Are you able to get that done? Because I don't want children to lose track of the things that are important for, that I think are important for them to learn and for them to gain skills and abilities and understandings. So if they're fascinated by the second vignette of the timeline of man, I, excuse me, now it's called the timeline of humans and it always should have been. If they're interested in that second vignette of the timeline of humans, but they're actually supposed to do follow-up work on the clock of the eras, I want to see that follow-up work done. Then if they want to expand and do more, more power to them. And in general, I haven't had that problem, but it does come up occasionally. Because I have an open lesson policy, and because I used to have a 6 to 12 class with children of all six ages, I had little first graders. For example, six-year-old children, beginning level children, come to lessons about cube root. Now, they weren't really, if you want to use what a lot of Montessorians use the word ready, they weren't ready for that lesson in one sense. But in another sense, they were ready to store that as what Montessori called an engram. So, five years later, or four years later, when we were really doing that work, those little girls said, Mr. Dorr, I think we this seems familiar to me. Did we do something? And that's what Montessori talks about with an engram. It's like a seed that sprouts at the appropriate moment. It waits until the appropriate moment and then, wow, it sprouted for them. So that lesson was planting a seed. So having them do all that extra follow-up work is not planting the seed. That's the fruit that comes later. Let's work on being sure that we get that seed properly planted and then when they're doing that lesson themselves in their own group, it sprouts and bears fruit. A beautiful answer, Michael, and I, I hope that's really helpful to everyone who's listening. Again, I think a lot of people tend to get overwhelmed with this one. Um, Kamalia, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Ransom asks, if there is one math, one math lesson given to every group per age, um, where do you meet the child if they're receiving the same lesson? 
I assume she means where are you gathering the kits? And um, tell, tell me, write to me if I've, if I've misunderstood what you wrote. Yeah, I'm not quite sure, but I would say if I have the seven-year-old, the seven-year-olds, which I would call the beta group, some people might call us, I don't like to use graders, like second graders, um, but that's what they are, the, the, the betas. And I'm going to give them a lesson about uh, addition, let's just say, for example. Um, I meet those children's varying abilities and skills by having differentiated follow-up work. Some of those children may have it nailed. That's fine. Because by, by having a heterogeneous skill group, those children with high ability can help the others and thus nail it themselves. But their follow-up work should be different. And the children who are challenged can benefit by being present and hearing the questions and answers given by the children who are more spot on. So there's a crossover that happens during the lesson of enrichment of all levels of skill because all levels of skill precisely because they're there. And I don't know if that was, and if that isn't going at what you were asking, because I wasn't quite clear on that, Go ahead and rephrase it, and Tim can help me to come back to it another time to deal with that question. She has just written us again. Let's see what she's saying. She's saying if the children are on different skills or advancements, how do we how do we meet them where they are in their ability if we're trying to give one lesson um, in math to each group, you know, uh, per week? Yeah, that's, that's, first of all, I want you to have, have faith. This is going to work. It's worked in so many schools and with so many people, it really works. It's, but the answer is kind of what I said in the first place. We need to do these things. We need to give the lesson to everybody in that age group so they feel collegiality. They feel the sense of belonging. They feel a sense of starting at the beginning of a trek and fighting the middle of that trek and completing it. It's a, almost a holy quest like the Knights of the Round Table undertook to go from the first year of elementary to the sixth year of elementary. And they do it with the other knights who are around that round table. Those are their colleagues. And so it's not an individual break it out and I'm all on my own in the world type thing. It's a collective quest. Now, once they're at the, what I'm calling the round table, which is the platform where you present lessons or wherever you do it, once they're in that group, everybody takes from the lesson what their own abilities and skills allow. Some children who you may think are not at that level can surprise you. They can surprise the heck out of you by what they take away. And I've got a lot of stories about that that I won't bore you with now, but it's really amazing. What you really need to do is also adjust the follow-up work to the skills of the children. So that, for example, if we're dealing with multiplication facts and you have somebody in there who's really good with the multiplication facts, then maybe drilling and practice with the multiplication facts is totally inappropriate. Instead, what they could be doing would be something like researching how a multiplication table was developed. It was developed, for example, by an Italian guy that we know as Fibonacci, Il Fibonacci, who is famous for a sequence of numbers that he came up with, but he's also famous for developing the multiplication table. So, in other words, we don't give the same follow-up work to every child. That's how it has to be differentiated, and that's how we honor the different skills and abilities, talents, and interests of the different kids in the class. Now, Tim, your picture went away, so are you still there? I am right here. Um, I had to turn it off because I got a message that my connection was slowing things down, so I turned it off. 
and okay. I'm conserving the uh, the bandwidth, but I'm still here. Um, I was Heather, afraid. Was I talking to uh, to nothing? Okay, good. No, not at all, Michael. Um, Heather Rivera asks, would you encourage children who are first year in the elementary program to interact with the material that they aren't familiar with or ready for, but they chose to attend the meeting? I would. That's Yes, I would, because I don't know what readiness is for sure, and I think most of us don't. We see the surface manifestations of readiness, that children may be able to accomplish certain tasks, say certain words, put things in sequence or order, classify things, match things, and so on. Whatever it is, we see these things that are surface manifestations. But underneath, we don't see what's invisible in the child's mind. And what they take away from the lesson may surprise us tremendously. The most important single thing I can say about this is often when you're giving a lesson to children that you think aren't quite ready for it, then sometimes watch out and see if some of them say something like, Mr. Dorr, now I understand what we were doing last week. This helped me understand it. When I hear that, it tells me that if I had waited for their understanding to develop, they would have missed that epiphany. They would have missed that moment of their own discovery. Now there's another case, and that is the case of the child who's completely confused. And you can have that whether they're so-called ready or not. And that requires individual coaching. Let's sit down and help individual children with whatever it is. But get this, and this is gospel from me, I do not expect the children to leave the lesson with a total understanding of everything that's been done. I expect them to leave with the capability of doing the follow-up work. After that, the understanding should have dawned. But the follow-up work the manipulation that they put their own hands on the material and they work with it and they do the follow-up, that's where the deep understanding happens because they create their own understanding. I don't create it for them. Okay, Tim? Well, these are good questions and I think maybe I have actually lost Tim at this point. Um, so I'm going to go on and until he comes back, I'm going to talk a little about where we were last time. This was the cover slide last time. And then, whoops, and then we went forward and I gave you what I called eight solutions for organization. And these eight solutions, the one we've spent most of our time on today with the questions, has been solution number four, basically producing regular lessons per group, per week, per subject. And that, I don't want that to be a sticking point. You can do other things too, but I'm telling you, you this is an important part of it all. So these are the eight steps that we went through last time. And I also talked about the three rivers. That first river, the river of curriculum, this is the plan, and curriculum is basically the set of skills, knowledge, abilities, understandings, talents, and so on, that we, as a community, have determined are important that we pass on to those who come after us. That's what it is. It's important that we, as a culture, give basic cultural understandings to continue the abilities and culture that we have. So for example, the ability to read. That's one of the things that we as a culture have decided, well, that's important, that's significant. We want children to be able to have that. So we want to put that in our curriculum. And then maybe we want to say, well, we want them to comprehend what they read. So that's another thing. That's where curriculum comes from. It shouldn't be arbitrary. It's based on what we, as a 
as a collective group, a community of adults have decided, we really think these things are important for children to know. So the second river was the river of interest, that children bring their own interests and fascinations to the table. And I promised you I'd talk about topic groups or focus groups today to address this second river. And then the third river is the river of skill or ability. And we've had some commentary on that today. And that is the, so those are actually sequential. Those are in order from the most important on down. So then I showed you last time the idea of having weekly lesson plans, which I wanted to talk about somewhat today too. And one of the questions Tim had was, hey, Michael, if you've got six subjects and only five days, how do we make that match? Square hole, round peg? How we make it match is by taking history and geography and mixing them up or alternating them to some extent so that we've got uh, those two cultural subjects matched together. Now, Tim, are you back? And the reality is we do the same thing with science and geography as well. Yes, a particular. They all, they all really blend together nicely. Yes, particularly with upper elementary, because that's a dynamic program. So you're right. That's 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 right. Um, and then we talked about having designated days, and designating those days slightly differently for children that are about seven and above than for the really little ones that are coming in for whom this whole elementary thing is a new deal. And we know from our study of children and sensitive periods and human development that not everybody leaves the stage of the absorbent mind and enters the stage of the adult reasoning mind on the same day. That's not going to happen. What you're going to have if you have a dozen, if you have say seven or eight or nine six year olds entering your class are some of the children who are still in the absorbent mind stage and some who are moving forward. And that's why we want to allow some time for the first year and the early second year children to have a little bit different schedule so they can all come aboard with the program of the elementary school. This is as far as I got last time. I got up to the great period, and this is where I'd like to pick up, but are there other questions? There are a few, Michael. Um, Emma asks, uh, does your system, Michael, leave plenty of time for spontaneous work choices, and what do you think about the system's effect on the type of spontaneous choices that the children are gonna, gonna make? Well, it does leave time for spontaneous choice, particularly within um, what I'm calling the topic groups or the uh, focus groups that I want to talk about in a minute. Uh, it also, another spontaneous choice is that ability to have, because you have an open lesson policy, the ability to go to a different group than your assigned group. You know what? I'm really interested in the trinomial cube. I say that because it's on the screen. I'm really interested in that and that group is doing it. I want to go see what it is. I want to I want to learn about that particular thing. So spontaneous is really an interesting word and sometime I can do a whole, I've done a whole webinar about what it means and how we have it but I think you need to know, also, we all need to know, it doesn't mean caprice. It doesn't mean chaotic. It actually means coming from oneself, but, some, but it doesn't mean just whatever occurs to one on the spur of the moment. That's caprice, and that's a different thing than spontaneity because that leads to chaos in the classroom. So we need to think of how we deal with spontaneous choice this way. The way is we need to create choices that children make that appear to them 
to be entirely their own choice, but we have structured the environment in such a way that that choice is one that we have planned. Nancy Rambush talked about that and compared the notion of the Montessori classroom to a supermarket, a famous comparison that she did, because you have that free choice when you enter a supermarket. You have the free choice to pick whatever you like, but guess what? The manager has arranged the shelves in such a way that you're likely to make the choices that he'd like you to make. You still have free choice, but that's how he's managed your choice, not by telling you what to do, but by arranging the environment in a specific way. We need to do that too, so that spontaneous choice is felt by the children, but curriculum management is felt by us. Okay, Tim? Yep, we've got um, another quick question, which is, Michael and Tim, why, why don't you like using the, why, why are you calling the kids first year kids or whatever? Why are we calling them that? Is that the question? Why are they called yeah. first year children? Yeah. Because that's what they are. There are children, in, in my understanding, in my classroom, I have children typically that are of three age groups so that they enter as five and a half or six and a half, somewhere in that range. They enter as first year students. And when they're first year students, they're novices. They're newbies, if you want to use that term. They're new kids on the block. I prefer novice. Uh, but they're new to things. And there can be an intimidation factor because those second and third year children can look awfully big uh, to those novices. And then the second year, they're, they're coming back and they have a sense of ownership of the classroom and they have, a, they're, they're no longer novices, they are participants. So at this stage I'd say they are fully participating in the life of the classroom and they have established ownership of the classroom and they want to express that to the new novices that are coming in by being helping the new kids to understand this is how we do things here. This is the way we, this is our classroom culture. And then the third year children go through another change because they become the leaders. And like it or not, they are the leaders. And, you know, we all love it when we have really conscious, capable, wonderful leaders. But we can have leaders in a lot of ways, but that's who's going to be the leaders. To a great extent, it's like they're the seniors in high school. Uh, they're, on, they're sitting on top of the heap, but not for very long. Because due to the three-year cycle, when they enter the fourth year, a new classroom, they're newbies all over again. And they go through this whole thing, this whole three-year cycle again. So I think there's really a clear-cut first year, second year, third year personality grouping of the kids, as well as a curriculum grouping, a skill grouping, an emotional grouping, and so on. So, Michael, there are a bunch of questions that are beginning to pour in. One of the most basic ones that's being repeated by people is they're struggling with understanding how large a group you can handle, and secondly, how much freedom of choice do the kids have, and how much are they allowed to spontaneously select work? You know, that question of the size of the group, unfortunately, but really is often beyond us. It's often made by the head of school and based on a lot of reasons. And I'm not even going to go into that. Your ideal grouping, your ideal classroom uh, is probably 21 to 27 children in that general range. Now I've probably alienated somebody by saying that who says, but I have 33 and it's great. but or I have 14 and I like that. But the reason I like a group of say 24, which is what I would choose as a default if I had my choice, is it's divisible by three. So I could have three groups of about eight children each if I had the ideal. And of those eight in each group, 
half would be boys and half would be girls, so I'd have a nice mix. Eight is a really good size group to have as a discussion group. If you have fewer than about five at a minimum that you're giving a lesson to, the character of the lesson changes and it often becomes more instructional, more didactic, and less of a two-way interaction street. It's more teacher to child and a lot less of child to child. Once you get a large enough group, you can get the discussion going that's child to child and that puts you out of the driver's seat, which is, after all, what we want. So a group of about, uh, I'd say six is down there toward the bottom, two, maybe nine, and ten is certainly toward the top of what can be managed well in a, in a group setting that I'm talking about. Um, sometimes, due to the structure of your school, you get what we refer to as a bubble. So you may have 13 first-year students, and then your second and thirds, uh, you may have five of each or something like that. And that's really a problem because that bubble perpetuates itself. Once those first-year students have grown up and they've become second and third years and they've left, now you have a big gap of 13 students. So it's really important to those of you who are school leaders, school heads, curriculum coordinators, board members, or whatever, to try not to let that happen in a classroom, but to try to keep the various age groups relatively balanced as best you can. And that, that your teachers will really be grateful, generally speaking, when that happens. Um, I don't recall the rest of There was more to that question, but I also want to get on with the great period and some other things. So why don't we give me more of that question and then let me take some time to present some new material. Um, Pamela, Pamela Brantley is asking multiple times, can you please repeat this statement? I'm, I'm very confused. Spontaneous choice is built by the student and what is built by the teacher? Well, the teacher builds the choices from which that child can make choices. So it depends on what you put on the shelf and where you put it on the shelf and what you present to children. Children are not free in most Montessori classrooms to choose anything that's in the room. Most classrooms have some sort of a rule or presumption that choice should be made from materials that have already been presented or from lessons that have already been presented. So. I want to know what has been presented to the children and the choice that they make should come from the lessons that, they, that have been presented. That's what the teacher's job is. So if I've presented in the last week a lesson on uh, the, back to the, say the trinomial cube and a lesson on the verb uh, and, and other lessons, then I, if the child is sort of like, what should I be picking? What should I work on? I can look at that and say, well, Let's talk about the trinomial cube work or the verb work. Which of those would you like to do right now? And that's where the child can make that choice. If the choice is unlimited, if it's anything you want to do, it's harder to make. It's harder for the child to make a choice when there's no clear palette from which to make those choices. Um, if you want to read the science behind the, the, the Angeline Lillard book, the science behind the, the method, that Angeline Lillard book, there's a chapter in it that talks about this idea about when you have so there's a certain point, you have too many choices. I think, and most of the time in the classroom, I give children two choices if I have to. Would you like to do A or B? Which are we going to do? This one or this one? And that's how the choice is made. And I hope I addressed the question that you were asking. And if not, well, we'll come back and I'll take another shot at it. <laughs> I know. Um, let's see if there's anything else we just really have to do. 
Um, are you presenting these things like the large bead frame and the checkerboard to a group as large as eight? And if so, how do you do that? Yes, I am. Um, you, uh, I don't know how you don't do that. I, you, you bring out the material, um, you present it to the group, you, um, maybe I'm not getting the question, uh, you, it's placed in front of the children and you um, show them, say it's the, the checkerboard, for example, which is one of the examples you just mentioned. There are several stages with the checkerboard that you might do. And so I might be on the second level, which is where they're supposed to know the facts to be able to do it. And I would present that to them and I'd allow different children to contribute ideas as to what's going what's happening at that point and then I would give that work to them uh, I'd give them the checkerboard work as follow-up so that they could individually interact with it and I'm again I'm thinking that that's uh, I hope that's getting at what it is I'm thinking you may have a, a deeper question that I I'm not quite getting yeah she means she may and again please feel free to jump in uh, and write to us again if you have anything else. This is asking, uh, so if you call your first graders or six-year-olds or first year, what do you call a kid that's entering as a second grader but it's his first year in the class? Well, he's still in the beta group. Psychologically, that child still belongs with the older kids. He doesn't want to be treated as a six-year-old when he's not. He doesn't want to be treated as a first grader, if you want to use that term, when he's actually not. Um, and, and here we're not talking about we're not talking about skills, we're not talking about any of that, we're talking about the psychology of the child and the way that child fits into the collective group. And that kid that's coming in as a second year child has an overpowering need to find her place in the classroom. That's really there. What am you know? It's it's all new stuff. How do I fit into this classroom? And to be with age mates, to be with other people, regardless, regardless of anything else, is critical. That it doesn't matter. There's one a you know, skill, ability, color, religion, background, race. I don't care what it is. I still have a place. I still fit in. Here, and that's one thing you can't take away. Every six-year-old will become a seven-year-old. So they'll have that. It's, it's firm. They may not all understand multiplication the same way or the checkerboard the same way, but they will be seven. And so she, I would fit her right into that group. Now, do I need to do uh, differentiated follow-up with her? Maybe so. I don't know that just because she's new. I don't know yet. I'm not going to rush to judgment. But it may be that that child fits right in perfectly. But I want to give you another thing that was talked about a lot while I was in elementary training and that I talk a lot as a trainer. And that is that the children have a desire. They, they, they really have a desire to fit in. They want to find their group. They want to be part of a group. And so we need to recognize that that's coming from within. It's not, it's not something we can teach them. This is an inner drive that they have to be part of a group. And that's why at elementary level, you start to see things like Cub Scouts and Brownies and the soccer teams and all of these kinds of things that involve groups of kids that want to hang together and do things collaboratively. And we can capitalize on that in the classroom. And we should, by saying to that newbie, you're part of this group. This is your place. So that's what I do with her. I would, I would let her be with her age mates. Michael, um, another question that's been asked, and the questions, again, keep just coming in faster and faster. So clearly, we're exploring a really interesting topic to people, and I, I'm thrilled with the way everyone is responding. I wish we could speak 
face-to-face. Uh, -face. By the way, again, Michael and I are planning to develop a course. Um, you might call it better a multi-session professional development uh, short course uh, in this area, and we hope to launch it early this this school year. Some of you may do it. Will not be part of the free webinar series, but it may be the kind of thing that some of you, uh, particularly those of you who are curriculum coordinators uh, or heads of schools, may really find useful to go into that kind of depth. And okay. those courses will be done so that they're a blend of live interaction, face to face. Um, using a technology called Zoom and uh, pre-recorded content and written content. Anyway, a question that's been asked is, Michael, other than observing, how do you assess kids' follow-up work? I mean, how do you know that they really understand what they're doing? Oh, that's a good question. And after this, after I answer this, I was thinking as you were talking, Tim, um, we may need another week to to complete the, this kind of topic because I've got probably, I've got probably another twenty slides and some of the questions are dealing with things that I had planned to address in any case. Um, so I want to I, I don't want to cut off the questioning, but I feel like the reason you're asking a lot of questions is this is a big thing, and I'm one of the very first things I said is hey. If you're having these issues, you need to change the way you're doing business. And that's hard. It's difficult. It's a challenge. And some of you are saying, but this isn't how I do things. And I know that. I know that. Now, would you ask me that question again, Tim? I'm sorry. Her question was, Michael, other than observing kids, how do you really evaluate the kids know things? For example, if you've given a lesson and you've given kids follow-up work, how do you evaluate that follow-up work and their understanding? Yeah, there are, and thank you for that question. There are obviously a lot of ways, but observing is really important because in the Montessori classroom, particularly if you are working with materials, their work is right out there in front of God and everybody. I mean, you can walk over and see if they've put the units on the left and the thousands on the right which is backwards, or if they've put them in the correct way. It's right out there to see, right while they're doing it. So I don't want us to ever underestimate observing. Please don't think that all observing has to be formal, where I mean, there's a real reason to do formal observing. But there's a lot of things that you can see otherwise. Uh, Yogi Berra, for example, the American baseball player and probably humorist, said you can observe a lot by just looking. And I think that's right. You can see a lot just by informally looking. Now what else was the question? Well, look at the follow-up work. In the elementary classroom, essentially every lesson should have a written component. Now I said essentially, so generally speaking, that should be the rule. There should be something that goes in a notebook, on a chart, um, that has some sort of graphic or written component. We need to see that. That's going to tell us a lot, too. When we look at that, did they really get it as to the role of, say, a possessive adjective? Are they really getting that? And are they writing it in the way that, they, that we want them to and using it? We can see them setting out symbols, grammar symbols, but are they writing it? So I want you to look at their work. Don't make that a religion, that we're making that the be-all and end-all of everything, but it's another piece of information that we can look at. And then the, the third thing is to actually talk with them. Actually say, Tim, do you know what the six kinds of adjectives are? Let's all talk. And I wouldn't talk with just one child at a time. Again, I'm deep into the group thing. And if Tim says, well, one of the things is it can show ownership. It can show who owns things. Then I can turn to somebody else and say, Greta, what do you think about that? Is Tim right? Would you agree? Why? And if he is right, 
that's great. And if he isn't, we're going to discuss it in any case. So as a group, here's my rule. If, there's, if I have a group of, say, seven or eight children, if there's one child who's showing a lack of understanding there, maybe I should take that child and go over that issue with her. If there's two children that show a lack of understanding, same thing. If there are three, then I made a mistake in the teaching and I need to go back and reteach the lesson to the whole group. Three is my magic number. If I hit that, uh -uh, I'm not going to keep dealing I, the, something went wrong with the lesson and I need to come back. So the evaluation of their understanding also informs me as a teacher what have I accomplished or possibly failed to accomplish. And if my accomplishment is questionable, I better do it better. I better improve it. I better come back to it. So let that, those three things, observe, look at their actual physical completed work and talk with them be the goals. Yeah, I know there's this other thing out there called testing and testing is a way of evaluation used by a lot of people but I am not, uh, I've done it, I do it, you all do it too, but it's not to my way of thinking the way that I would advocate for our assessment of children. Couple more questions, Michael, and you're absolutely right. We're, you know, this it looks like today is a, almost a question and answer session. People have so many questions after last week. Um, we've got a question from Bonnie Miller, and she's asking, um, is there a language curriculum available for viewing? And Bonnie, I, I'm not sure if you are a, a trained Montessori elementary guide. You hopefully got certainly your albums, but in terms of curriculum scope and sequence, there are them out there. Um, there is no textbook. So, you know, Monastery Compass has one online that you can see, and it's built into the software. Michael, you may have thoughts about other, quote, language curriculums. Uh, I think language is, thank you for that question, Bonnie. I think language is probably the area that may have the greatest variance from training course to training course, from program to program, from school to school, and even from teacher to teacher. There's a lot of variation in that. Uh, one of the things that is really important that we do in a school is agree on some basic things. So we're going to agree, for example, on what should be the basic language program in our school. And what the Montessori Foundation has published as a curriculum, what your school may have already developed as a curriculum, what Montessori Compass has, can be a great beginning for you to look at and say, does this fit with the way that we want to teach the language components in our school? And I would actually drill down on that and be sure that we're all on the same page with everything. Now, I want to throw another um, firecracker into the midst and have, and you'll probably react to this too, but I believe that your school will generally function better in terms of curriculum if you collectively adopt a set of albums regardless of whether they were the ones you personally had in training or not, that you say, okay, we're going to use these as our guides. And that at that way, when you plan lessons, everybody is functioning from the same general guide. Now, if you want to alter that album and you say, I don't like this particular thing, then that should be subject to discussion. But it should be a collective discussion, which various people in the school all participate in. And that can even be drilled down to really small things, like I mentioned with language, the possessive adjective. What exactly is the possessive adjective? How are we going to use it? And how does that differ from a possessive pronoun? Let's be sure we're all on the same page with things, even at that level, even that little. And then on bigger levels, are we going to use the same kind of words to describe something like, will we use the word trapezium or trapezoid to describe a given figure so that we're all teaching from the same standpoint. 
So when it comes to language, which was your question, I think there are a lot of different looks at it in terms of content and sequence both. And it really helps if everybody together agrees upon what it is we're trying to do here in the school and will be helped if we have the same guides, I don't mean teachers, but manuals that we are working from so that we're not working across purposes. And here's something I want you to get rid of. I want you to get rid of the, this is a hard one, I want you to get rid of the idea that because you had it this exact way in training that that's gospel. If you start to say, but that's not how I had it in training, that's a divisive thing that breaks staff members up, and, they, and especially people that come from a lot of different training backgrounds. The fact that we had different trainings is no different than it is in a conventional school where somebody went to one university and somebody went to another and so on. But they can come together and so can we. And so that's really important that we're on literally the same page and figuratively as well. So with language or with any great answer, Michael. Um, Bonnie has clarified and what she really means is that very <laughs> simplistic big picture um, examples that you provided for math and science and so forth. Yeah, I have not personally done that for language, um, but I, I have that as a high agenda item for me to do. There are people who have done that, and when I go to schools, I look at those. But um, short answer is I don't have a language curriculum like that that I can um, post for you today. I'm sorry. And again, yeah, and again, Bonnie, those kinds of things are really the crudest big picture curriculum map. Um, that's not really curriculum, and I got sidetracked by that word. Um, but I understand what you're looking for, and they're very useful. Um, and so it's a good question. I wish we had it, but at the moment we don't. Um, I have uh, something like that in the IMC members library. It's, uh, it's certainly not complete, and it's not organized as elegantly as Michael's. Um, but again, you can look at it. The other thing you can do is if you use Monastery Compass, Monastery Compass is everything but the kitchen sink in there. And I know it's overwhelming for a lot of people when they first see it. The reason for that is most training centers really don't cover everything that is supposed to be covered in a North American school. And so what we did was a cross comparison of all the topics, not only in the Common Core, but everything that the various national highly respected organizations like the National Council for Mathematics Education. We, we try to make sure we really covered everything and didn't leave something out that kids would be normally expected to know. But if you look at Monastery Compass at the big level, you don't have to drill down all the minutia, you get some of the kinds of things that I think you're looking for. Um, we have another question, uh, which is... is a sec, Tim, let me comment on that too. Sure. Look, look, as a trainer, the truth is it's impossible for any training course or any university to cover everything. It's also impossible for you to cover everything. So you have to make some choices when you're doing curriculum planning, when you're doing this kind of thing. The area, for example, of language is never ending. So all right, that means there's going to have to be some pruning because you've only got six years. And you could go on and get a PhD in just 17th century Irish poets. That's only one little area. It's a big area to that person that got that doctorate. We can't deal at that level with every single thing. So part of your program as you develop it is to say, what's essential? What's really essential. And then those 17th century Irish poets can be a topic that goes to the focus groups, or the topic groups. When somebody says, I'm really interested in that because I'm Irish, is anybody else interested in this class that would like to share that with me? Great. But that isn't going to be a key piece of your whole curriculum 
because you only have so much time. Remember, and this is the thing upon which I'm basing this idea, is Montessori's dictum that we are to give the children the keys to the universe, not the entire universe. We can't do that. That's why she said the keys. So, when you look at the language thing, you're going to get overwhelmed. Okay, once you take a deep breath or two, you have to start saying, well, which are the key things that we do that we need to do? We need to do some things here in grammar. We need to do things in sentence analysis. We need to do things in um, comprehension. And from that, you narrow down and drill down. And this is kind of what Wiggins at all is, a guy named Wiggins who, who made what they call the backwards curriculum, starting with what it is that we want children to have achieved by the time they end in the school, and then start to think, well, what do they have to do to get there? And then what do they have to do to get to where they have to go for that, and so on. And working backwards to ultimately, oh, gee, what would we have had to do in the beginning of our six-year program? So curriculum planning is, to a great extent, going to end up, for, in language more than anything, um, a program of pruning, getting rid of those beautiful things that are just too much. There's so much. Good, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Uh, Norma Melica, Mele <laughs> I think I'm pronouncing it right, Norm. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced. Says, uh, Michael, can you elaborate more on what you mean by the open lesson policy and how you create that in the class? Yes, Norma. I, I'm hoping that you're engaged with um, an elementary or higher program in some way, either as a guide, a teacher, uh, a curriculum specialist, or a, a school leader of some sort because this applies more to that age group by far than it does to the primary or um, three to six year old children's house group. In the elementary, one of the dicta that was driven home to me constantly in my Montessori training in Europe and something that I tried over and over to implement and found it to be successful was essentially every lesson should be in a group. There should always be, there are no lessons essentially that are individual. Okay, well nothing is a hundred percent, but that's a guideline. And it's the opposite of the guideline for early childhood, which is essentially all the lessons are individual. And of course there are exceptions, but most of them are individual. But once you've got these groups, who gets into the group becomes the question. So I've got a group of, I'm going to say my alpha group is my six-year-old group. And they're going to be dealing with, let's say, uh, the addition strip board, and they're dealing with all of the different combinations that equal 10. 5 plus 5, 6 plus 4, 2 plus 8, and so on. All of these different combinations that equal 10. But I also have other children who would like to sit in on this lesson and could benefit from that lesson. Well, you know what? If I limit the lesson only to my target population, those six-year-olds, these other kids aren't able to exercise their choice, and I want them to be able to, or I want to help them make that choice, and that's the open lesson policy. It's opening it up to these other folks. And those other folks are either younger children, or let's just say other children who are fascinated by it, or their older children who may need a review that I have decided may need a review that they think they need a review or sometimes it's children that say oh man I just love this lesson I, I, I'd like to sit down on this again I want to come to this lesson because I like it and of course that's a thrill to me because it, that means I did something right I must have made that lesson motivational exciting happy good whatever you want to call it so the open lesson policy is saying you got to focus, you got a, uh, a target group for whom you're presenting this, but you're making it available to other children in the classroom, either by their own choice or by your suggestion. Okay? All right, I think... Um, 
Michael, oh. Emma is asking if you'd elaborate on the D. Michael, can you hear me? I do, but... Uh, Michael? You, uh oh, yes, I'm there. And it's showing that I'm recording. Um, hello, okay. are you... Am I coming? Michael, off? I hear you. Oh, good. No, I hear you. All right. He's fine. Good. Well, uh, ask I me have a question. question. I have another question for you, Michael. Go Can ahead. You hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Emma would Emma writing the All right. Uh, Tim, I am not hearing you. At that moment I heard and, Emma. And the need for practical, constructive, and active follow-up work as opposed Okay, hold on. Uh, I need Can you hear me now, Michael? I'm hearing you now, but I got cut off with, just as you started with Emma. You just said her name, and that's as far as I got, and I lost it. And I'm sorry, Emma. I really want to hear your question. Michael, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try again. Let's see if you're hearing me now. I hear you, Tim. Great. Her question is this. Can you speak to the importance of having practical, constructive, and active follow-up work instead of workbooks and worksheets? <laughs> uh, that's a, I, I hope you hear me. Yes, that's a particular sore point with me because I really do not care for workbooks and worksheets. Again, nothing is 100%, but this comes awfully close for me, that those are generally not uh, interactive, progressive, challenging, and positive way of trying to help the child uh, gain understanding and positive experience with whatever is being taught. They just aren't. And you can make exercises without a workbook that are also stupid or also are of the lowest level. But you don't want to do that. The thing is, you have the power to make really challenging, exciting, fun, and motivating follow-up work. That is something you can do. Now, our follow-up work in a Montessori classroom may not leave evidence. For instance, if you build the 45 layout, after it's taken down, it's gone. And that bothers some people. It doesn't bother me, but it bothers some people. Whereas in a workbook, when you're done with that page, it's there to sh take home and show. I don't care about that. That workbook is much less engaging than building the 45 layout would have been. That's a much better thing. And some of the activities in a, in a workbook might be things like two columns of words or phrases or designs or figures, and you draw a line from one column to the matching thing in the other. We can do that with materials. Another thing is filling in blanks. We don't need to fill in blanks. We need to go way beyond that. You see, here's the problem. That workbook or worksheet or task card, what those things tend to do is they simplify the material, they simplify the program so that it can be printed in the workbook, so that it can be there because they're presuming you don't have all the wonderful learning material that you actually have. Instead, my gosh, we have riches in the Montessori classroom that we can capitalize on. And so, no, I would not use, mm -mm, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the workbook, worksheet, task card camp. I would take myself out of that camp and see children engaging directly with materials, with each other, and with me, rather than with a piece of paper. Great. Um, we see, um, we have something from Patty Wright who says, we see so many first-year students that are terribly challenged with recording lessons. We understand, but their ability to form letters using a functional grip and attend 
pending to align. What do you do about that? Is this Patty right in Kansas City? I wonder. There's a Patty down there that I know. You can respond to that, Patty, if that if that is you. Um, one of the things I've learned in Montessori is there's more than one person out there with the same name, sometimes in different areas. Um, I think that we need to realize that, every, that there is no material that is aimed specifically, or there, there's very little material in language, for example, that you should say this is primary material only, or this is elementary material only. We need to have a way that we can help those first year children who have problems with writing, with letter formation, with, with that kind of thing. We need to help them at that level. We need to bring that on board so there is a program and yes, in engaging with such things as letter sounds, letter formation, the, cult, the, the, the matching of sound to letter with phonemic analysis, with phonics, and to a lot of people they say, well that should have been accomplished back when they were six, five years old. That should have, that's supposed to have already been done. But supposed to doesn't cut it. It just doesn't work if that's, if it's not true. So we need to think that child you're describing, what we need to do is actually use many of those materials. And one of the things that I've always done in training is we start at elementary with the whole idea of sound. We begin with sound analysis with no presumption that they have accomplished that when they were four or five. No. If they are good at it, great. But one of the biggest problems with children when they get to letters, letter formation, sounds, and eventually reading, one of the biggest problems goes all the way back that the foundation wasn't created properly. And you can't build a good house without a foundation. So I say go back to the basics with those children and start with the material such as sandpaper letters, such as metal insets, such as the movable alphabet, starting at those at those levels. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Michael, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think that I don't think primary classes necessarily really are putting enough work on handwriting development and fine motor control other than the obvious things that we do with practical life. There's a lot more that leads to the early development of control of the hand, unless a child has a neurological issue. And I was one of those children. I never had good eye-hand control. And so I, I grew up learning on a typewriter, uh, even as a little kid a long time ago. Um, <laughs> Teresa is saying, uh, this is great, um, but can we go on with the presentation? Um, and of course, the answer is we can. On the other hand, we've got all these questions, and we invited it, and it's, it's uh, catch-22. Teresa, I want to assure you that Michael really will do what he thinks is best. We only have about 15 minutes, and it may be that this week was really a question and answer session. And if that's the case, then next week we'll pick up and we'll do a formal session on what Michael was going to cover. And frankly, we won't take very many questions. We'll just bore through it. And again, this is why it's so important to make time to do these things right. Um, you can't really do it in an hour and a half. There's lots and lots of discussion. Um, let me just say, let this be a lesson to all of us about how we do lesson planning. I make a lesson plan for this hour and a half session. Now, did I accomplish everything that I set out to accomplish? No, I didn't because I had to respond to the needs of the students. It's the same thing when we're working with children. Sometimes we need to say their needs trumped my plan, and that's okay. And that's what's happened. That's what Montessori meant by following the child. And that is one of the different... Uh-oh. 
Tim, I've lost you again. Many conventional schools. Um, here's another question from Swan May. That's major areas of, of curriculum. You got five days. How do you factor in SEL, social emotional learning lessons? I think I don't personally I don't have those as a separate category. Social and emotional learning is foundational to the entire classroom. It's foundational to all the lessons. When we're doing things with children, if we're careful to be doing things in social groupings and we're careful to support interaction between all of them and we're accepting of the various kinds of interaction that they offer when we're doing a discussion group, then we're going to be fostering higher level social abilities. We have to realize that that's one of the foundational drives of the elementary child is society, is group, is to be uh, with each other and they are emotionally unhinged when that can't happen, when for some reason we block that. Of course, that's what happens in a lot of conventional schools. Now, back in the dark ages, when I went to school, we all sat in individual desks that were all bolted to the floor, actually. The, the entire classroom was fixed and everything was there. And there was no mingling, no mixing where you formed informal groups. But we have the power to do that. We can create those right within the time that we're doing our geometry lesson or our history lesson. So that's what I do. Now, it's not to say you shouldn't do different lessons, but that's, that's, that's what I do with my social and emotional uh, component of the classroom. That's a great answer, Michael. Let's see what else we have. Um, Therese is saying, control of error is an important tool for assessing student understanding of a new concept. Shouldn't this be important as observing during, as important? during uh, as observation during an assessment of a student's work. Sorry, Teresa, I didn't get that quite right. Yeah, it should be. You're talking about control of error, and I want to introduce a new phrase, not Montessori's phrase, but Michael's phrase, which is control by error. Children should be expected to make errors, and we should celebrate that. It's okay for children. In fact, it's good when children make mistakes. Montessori actually indicated and wrote that we should be thankful for our mistakes because we learn from them. And so one of the things that Joanne Deek, for example, the psychologist, uh, has talked about is what she calls not yet. And if the children don't understand something, it's not that they failed, it's just not yet. They just don't get it yet. But they can make mistakes and be proud of that. So, yeah, we should be looking at control of error, but what you don't want to do, according to my thought, what you don't want to do is to control the error to such an extent that it's impossible for them to make a mistake. They need to make mistakes. They need to know how to deal with that, and they need to know how to successfully re-engage with that material and how to eventually pull success out of it. And there's research on that, and I hate to tell you, but to some extent it's gender connected. So um, there are, by research, more boys, and this is from Joanne Deke, more boys who are willing to re-engage after failure than girls. So we have about 80% of the boys, nothing is 100%, are willing, highly willing to re-engage after failure. That's the opposite with the, with the female population in elementary schools, not just Montessori, but in general. So we really need to help children be courageous, be risk takers, be able to make a mistake. So I'm kind of thinking control of error is important, but more important to me is the control by error, that when they make the error, that helps control the attitude and the engagement that they have with the material in future, 
and I want that to be okay. I tried it. It didn't work out. I'm going to try something again. That's the attitude that I'd like to see, uh, the sort of can-do attitude among everybody, boys and girls, in my classrooms. Okay? Excellent. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, Deb Cryer is asking so many creative things happening, but often teachers resort to the same old ideas. I understand they should be student driven, but sometimes just being able to offer a couple of ideas gets their ideas flowing. Well, I did not get that entire question. Tim broke up as he was saying it. And again, I'm going to say, is this Deb from Indiana? I think if it's you, hello, it's good to hear from you. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to get to the lesson planning component that in my notion I was going to get to today. And I specifically want to deal with that issue in, in a great deal of detail. So if we can come back to that whenever I get to new slides and get to go forward, um, if you can hold that thought, Deb, I'd like to come back to it at that point. I think that, that makes a lot of sense, Michael. Can you hear me okay? I Now I can. Yeah, you're in and out, Tim. And, uh, of course, I like it when you're in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure what's happening, but we, we don't have much more time. Um, Let's just see if there's a few things for all this. We're getting a lot of thank yous. Um, well, let me do so. Having, uh, let me finish up um, what I was a couple of slides here that I want to just wrap up a cup one segment of what it is that we were dealing with. And so I'm going to jump forward and and just deal with a couple of issues. And one of them is the Great Period. So I'd like to talk about this slide has been in front of your faces for the last half an hour. But you now, because it's been in front of you, you know that it's this chunk of time that's a two and a half to three hour period in the morning. And that it's not to be interrupted by recess, group snack, class meetings, pullouts, whatever. This is absolutely essential to the kind of classroom management plan that I've been talking about. If children have their time segmented, broken up and you're managing the time rather than the content, the time rather than the materials, you're going to break up the way they think. And their thinking will not be holistic in nature. And so it's, it's a self-defeating plan. We want to be sure to give them this. And we're not doing this just because Montessori says so. We're doing it because it works. It is actually working. And don't forget the idea that Montessori wrote about called false fatigue. And that is the point at, in the open, in the great period, when at the beginning, maybe half an hour to 45 minutes into it, children can show themselves to be fatigued or tired. And that may seem, oh, we've all got to go out for recess. But if you let it go, what she discovered and what I've discovered as well is then they can re-engage with what's really an important work for that morning. So let's have this great period. And don't say it's 14 minutes or 22 minutes. Those, those don't work. It's got to be a, a longer period of time. And I've got a couple other things that I promised you that I would talk about. And one is topic groups. I've used this focus group, topic group language. You may be thinking, what the heck is it? Well. The main kind I'm talking about is an interest group. There are also a task forces, but the main kind is an interest group. And so I want to encourage my elementary children to put their heads together and say things they'd like to learn about that maybe I'm not touching on. Or maybe I haven't touched on enough. You know, Mr. Doerr, I'm really interested in dinosaurs. Now we're done with dinosaurs. We're moving on with the timeline of life. But I want to stay with the Jurassic period. I want to learn more. Well, who else wants to do that? Let's, and there may be kids who are all age groups. This is not age grouped. 
They, and so we can form an interest group that meets, and typically those meet in the afternoon. And I meet with them, and I have a criteria. If you are choosing to be part of that interest group for whatever period of time it runs, like 10 weeks or something, you've made a commitment. Be part of it. Don't be there for a week, and when we're done with Tyrannosaurus Rex, you decide, I don't want to hear anything else because I don't want to hear about Steggy. We're going to learn. We're going to commit to each other to support one another. Now, my favorite story about this is actually something that you can tell just by looking at me. And those of you who know me and have seen me know that I probably have zero fashion sense, right? I don't really do well with that. So I had a group of young children, they were all girls, who wanted a focus group on fashion. They had come to the wrong teacher. I said, I don't think that's important. I don't think that's something we're going to take our time and study. Well, I went home and I berated myself. I realized that was the wrong answer. I had done the wrong thing. I had denigrated what it was they were really interested in because I wasn't interested in it particularly. And I felt humiliated and bad. And I told them the next day, you know, I was wrong. Let's make a group focused on fashion. And they were all excited then. But I said, we're not just going to page through brides magazines. We're going to need to do more than that. We're going to need to think of what it is that we could learn about fashion. Should we learn about fashion associated with time? Maybe we'll make a timeline. Should we learn about fashion associated with events like weddings? Should we be looking at fashion and geography? Should we be spending some time on each of those? They spent two years on that group and they were deeply into it and they focused on all of those things and more so the thing is no that's not in our regular curriculum but they have an interest in it and it drove the focus group so an interest group is a mixed age group and it's all formed around common interests the task force is a different thing that's when you have a specific task that has to be accomplished like memorizing the multiplication facts and that group fades away when the task has been accomplished. But something like fashion doesn't fade away because there, there are people that devote their whole life to it. There's an entire industry around it. And that's what I realized. And my kids knew more about it than I did. And they did a wonderful job with it. Now, I want to talk a little about guided discovery. And guided discovery means you're only presenting certain key lessons and you avoid details. And I realize as I'm getting to this, I'm looking at the clock, I don't have time to deal with the issue of guided discovery. But I'll come you're back to it next it. week. But you're doing I great. Want, I want you to know this. Thanks, Tim. I want you to know this. What guided discovery is about is teaching fewer lessons and purposely having gaps between the lessons for children to discover, realizing that it will be more meaningful to them if they discover it than if you give it to them. For example, uh, here's an example, stamp game division. In my album, look on that left-hand box that's boxed in red. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, lessons for stamp game division. If I'm following my plan and giving a lesson a week, that's a fourth of the year on that one notion, stamp game division. Because I'm teaching it with a one-digit divisor, then with the remainder, then with a two-digit, then with a zero in the dividend, and so on. Each of these. What I've come to with guided discovery is I teach division with a one-digit divisor, and I'm going to go back for a minute, and then I encourage, I give no more than two or three or maybe five examples. I have very few prepared problems for them. And those problems all work out perfectly. Then I want them, and I have a whole technique for how they create self-created problems. And so they then need to create their own problems, and their own 
division stacking division examples and when they do that they will come up with every special case that exists if they come up with if they're able to just make up numbers and divide one into the other every one of these ideas that's in that left hand box will be discovered without me having a lesson on it and then I can say hey everybody can you come over here for just a sec I want you to take a look at what Tim is doing look he has a problem that doesn't work out perfectly let's see what we can do about that so in other words you're capitalizing on the teachable moment that moment of discovery that Tim has made and instead of it being a mistake or an error or a screw-up oh my god why didn't it come out right it's an opportunity it's an exciting motivational moment instead of all these nine components coming from me it's coming from the discovery of the child who sort of accidentally runs into it but we've structured the work so that they will run into it so now I've reduced my whole stamp game division component to only two lessons I've reduced it by more than 75 percent by letting the children discover the steps in between and that's what this will do and in order to make it happen you've got to avoid task cards you've got to avoid prepared problem cards except for maybe two or three up to five examples at the first you don't focus on mastery but instead you want to make the children pay attention to technique how it is that we do this and how it is they work with the material and don't worry they'll discover all of these potential difficulties maybe not in the order you would have taught it but it'll come up and now I'm going to sum up and say these were the eight big things that I talked about and that really as far as I was hoping to get um, yeah. and let's jump back to it and, and get back to it. Tim, go ahead. Uh oh, I heard you a little bit well, there. Michael, I would suggest that we wrap it up here. We're, we're over time. We've got to wrap it up. Can you hear me all right? I do. I do. Yeah, we do. So let's so, pick up on this next week. Quick review and then continue forward. This has been a real pleasure. I had not planned for the whole question and answer thing, but I think it really met a felt need. No question. So once again, what we're covering today and what we were covering last week and what we'll cover next week is just the, the tip of the iceberg of information to share with you. and this is being developed into a very specific course that will be added into the Montessori Foundation's Montessori Leadership Institute. This is intended for experienced curriculum coordinators, guides who are anxious to learn well, you know, at a deeper level, and of course administrators, heads of schools, leaders of schools, and that's what we do. So Michael, um, we're showing a new screen at this moment, a new slide. Let's, let's just call it there for this week. Thank everyone for joining us. And next week, we'll pick right up where we left off, and we'll do a little review. We'll avoid digging into questions to this level of depth so Michael can cover all the information. I want to remind you that if you're a member of the International Monastery Council, that these recordings are stored in the... Um, members library and there's Dr. Michael Doerr with his new book Deep Well of Time. I, 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 thought, I, I, thought, I, well <laughs> I thought I'd promote it. Why not? You should. It's going to be a great book. So again we'll, um, we'll see you all next week and I've got a record of all your questions that you're asking and we'll just try to to cover them over the weeks ahead. This is a series that will probably take us through the better part of August because we know we're really touching on a deep need. So figure this is probably going to be a five-part series.
maybe six. And if you're willing to take the journey with us, we'll take it with you. So, Michael, thank you as always. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for participating and your feedback and your questions. We so appreciate your support. So this is Tim Selden and Dr. Michael Doerr, the Montessori Foundation, signing off for this week. We'll see you next Wednesday, 1 o'clock, East Coast time, United States. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.